When my children were very small, I used to make up bedtime stories for them about a girl named Claire and her little brother Gunther, who discovered an enchanted island in the lake in their backyard. Now, the plot lines would vary. Sometimes it was a portal to another universe or a forest made entirely of candy. But regardless of these characters' adventures, they would always, always find their way back home at the end. To me, that's what makes a great story. The good guys finding their way back home at the end. Today, but we know that in reality, that doesn't always happen. Today, I'd like to tell you the real life story of a young woman named Alexis. Here, an 11-year-old girl spending Christmas in the North Carolina mountains with her three-year-old brother and her parents. In this next photo, she is 14 years old on her first day of high school, entering a highly competitive program at a school of the arts. And here she is on the far left with cousins and grandparents at the beach, not long before addiction completely destabilized our lives. You see, less than two years after this photo was taken, Alexis would miss her own high school graduation after we had checked her in to a drug rehab facility. Alexis is my daughter, as you've probably guessed, my firstborn. She's the one who got me making up bedtime stories in the first place. But keep in mind that as I was writing this story that I'm telling you today, I didn't know what the ending would be. Whether she would end up on a path to recovery, in prison, or worse. Such is the nature of addiction and relationships. The suspense is always there. When the trouble started, we couldn't even fathom it. She had always pushed herself to be the best in her class. As an all-A student with high test scores, she was on a path to pursue Ivy League dreams if she wanted to. As well as a top scholar, she was also a talented photographer and a filmmaker, singer and actress. She was also a sweet kid. But little did we know that in the shadows, substances like benzodiazepine, fentanyl, and heroin were slowly changing her identity, reducing her to yet another victim of this thing that we call the opioid crisis. Well, this is what the crisis means to me, losing this girl to a dark and dangerous world from which we could not rescue her. Remember the picture book, Where the Wild Things Are? Little Max gets sent to his room without supper one night where a jungle grows all around him. And he finds himself far, far away in the land of wild things. I kind of imagine that this is exactly how addiction can grow in children. In the privacy of their own bedrooms, their iPhones, social media, over weeks and months, it can still be a manageable secret. But after a while, the child becomes completely lost. Imagine that your own child, who's been acting up lately, disappears from her bedroom and really is gone day and night for a year, and then another year. And that she meets dangerous monsters while she's out there in the world. But in this case, the wild things are violence, poverty, homelessness, human trafficking, and at the heart of it all, cold, hard addiction. Like many people who struggle with this same kind of thing, Alexis's road to addiction was paved with underlying depression and anxiety, a temporarily disordered home life. We divorced when she was 12. 
and as is typical of teens, a need to fit in. But a lot of kids struggle with these same things. So why is it that some fall into deeply destructive patterns and others don't? Well, as I understand it, most people who try out illicit drugs have no problem leaving them alone, especially if traumatic things happen because of them. But depending on the drug, a small percentage of users do get irreparably hooked, meaning their neurological pathways are forever changed the moment they try that first hit. But the real complications play out down the road. After an addict has been consumed by this lifestyle for two or three years, it's a tough road back to normal. And by tough, I mean virtually impossible, especially in this country where addiction has been so brutally criminalized. Early on, of course, her dad and I tried to intervene with lots of therapy and some antidepressants, but nothing seemed to help. So by the end of her senior year in high school, our only option was residential rehab. And that weekend that she missed her graduation, my entire family gathered. You see, they had all booked flights months in advance to see the first grandchild graduate before we knew what was going on. While other families were planning graduation parties, we just came together in recognition that she was safe and in recovery for the time being. And although she missed that ceremony, she received her diploma on time. After this first go around in rehab, and after a few months living in a sober living house, she actually started college. It felt like a miracle. We set her up in a dorm room, all expenses paid, with a combination of scholarships and hard-earned savings. Despite major setbacks her senior year of high school, she actually earned the Florida Bright Future Scholarship at the highest level. But the irony is that the future for her would be darker than anyone could have predicted. Within two months of the semester starting, she was missing from her dorm, living on the streets, living in motels, only contacting us once in a while. And I dreaded those late night calls from unknown numbers. One time she called and told me that her phone had been stolen at gunpoint. We hadn't talked in months. She said she needed money for a new phone. I was appalled, of course, but all I could say was, tell us where you are. If you agree to go to rehab, we'll come pick you up and help you. But she refused. So I said, I'm sorry, and I hung up the phone, not knowing if or when we would ever speak again. But that next time that she called, she did reach out for help. I found her at a gas station, basically hiding in the bushes. Her face was smeared with black makeup, and she was covered in bruises or new tattoos. I couldn't tell which. I barely recognized her as someone I would know, much less as my only precious daughter. I remember she had a deep gash on her forearm with thick black stitches. I tried to hold it together that day, and I drove her home, but all I could think was, how could this frightened, broken person be the same beautiful and courageous child as this? What had gone wrong? And what was wrong with me as a parent? Fortunately, she went to rehab that time, and another time, and another time. And each time, I know she took a new set of tools with her. 
but she always slid back into that spiral of chaos and despair and addiction. And then there was the financial impact. Bills for ER visits, ambulance rides, overdoses apparently, and of course the rehab stays. We had no way of paying it after a while, and that's when we made the heartbreaking decision to use her college funds. But pretty soon, there wasn't any more money even from that. This kind of thing went on for more than two years. And when I found out she was using yet again, I told her not to contact me anymore. You see, I think I had lost all hope. We were living in the middle of this global pandemic within a health system that had little time to bolster mental health services, much less unravel the knot of addiction and criminalization and poverty. Rehab centers had a sudden shortage of beds. And even if we could find a bed, who was going to pay for it this time around? But the facts were clear. Because Alexis had a serious chemical dependency, she now had physical health problems, a criminal record, lots of debt, and no more social or emotional support. She was going to be just another statistic, and there was little I could do. I had a son to raise, classes to teach, a house to keep safe, and now the threat of this dreaded virus. But you'll be happy to know that since then, things have been turning around. So here's the ending of my story for now. When Alexis decided that she finally needed to get help again, she had very few choices. She had lost her job and her apartment, and her only connection, a boyfriend, had been arrested. I wasn't even willing to allow her in our home anymore, so she went to a shelter. The only thing that I could offer was a car ride from the shelter to a state-funded detox center, and there she found safe harbor for the time being. So over the last six months, she's made her way from that detox center to rehab to an independent recovery house. She's been holding a steady job, paying her rent, going to group meetings. I talk to her almost every day, and she even has a good relationship with her little brother, who, as you can see, is not so little anymore. Things aren't perfect, though, and I'm always painfully aware that this story still may not end well for her. But my life is still filled with joy and love and even a strong sense of hope that seems to regenerate itself over and over again. So I'll leave you with this. I would have never chosen this story for me and my family, of course. But if there's a moral to it, maybe it's this. The monsters are out there. Stay alert. But don't become so afraid that you become a monster yourself. It's really easy to get addicted to the anger and the drama. So seek help for yourself. And when you feel strong enough, and the time is right, let your child or your addict come back into your life. The best advice I ever received about addiction is to never give what you don't have, financial, emotional, or otherwise. I'm just glad that I have something to give these days, even if it's just a car ride, a hug of encouragement, or one more chance to help her find her way back home again. Thank you.